Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. This is a special panel interview with five wild weasels who flew the F-105 and dueled with the SA-2 guideline service to our missile during the Vietnam Air War. It was a huge privilege for me to interview Fish, Lucky, Paul, E.T. and Fred, so thank you to all of them for giving up their time. The interview actually took a long time to set up, more than six months in the making, but would not have happened at all had it not been for Fred and then Lucky, who combined convinced the others to join in. Before I stop talking and let the interview roll, I have, as you would expect, a simple request. All I ask is that you like, share and comment on the video. Those are the three things that really gets the YouTube algorithm going, gets it working and gets it more likely to recommend the video to other people. So I'm not even asking for you to subscribe, although that would be nice. Um, just like it, drop a comment, tell us what you think about it, and share it with other like-minded individuals. Anyway, with that, I'll leave you to listen to these five incredible guys talk about their story. Enjoy. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, it's a real privilege to have you on the channel. Um, this is an experiment for me, never done an interview with this many uh, participants before. Uh, so we'll see how it works out. Hopefully it'll be a success. Um, I wanted to ask if, um, before we start talking about the Wild Weasel mission, because that's the focus of today's conversation and your experiences of that mission, uh, I wanted to ask if you would briefly introduce yourselves. Um, Ed, could we start with you? My name is Ed Johnson. I go by ET. Uh, I've been flying the F-105 and also the F-4G. So I've had a little bit of experience flying both airplanes and then uh, a lot of engineering and test related to the F-16 uh, weasel side of it. Wayne? My uh, name is Wayne Fisher. I go by Fish. Um, fighter pilot, test pilot. Uh, flown the uh, F-105, the F-4. Uh, F-14, F-15, F-16, uh, A-4, A-7, those pretty much comprise most of my fighter time, which is about 3,000 hours. Uh, most of my time uh, out of a little over 3,000 in fighters has been in the F-105, and it's uh, still my first love. Like uh, Ernest Hemingway's quote, Man has one virginity to lose in fighters, and if it's a lovely airplane, he loses it too. That is where his heart will be forever. Thank you, Fred. So um, I had the same feeling about the thud. I flew about fourteen hundred hours in the in the thud. Uh, not a lot of it in the weasels. Um, graduated pilot training in nineteen sixty nine. Uh, went to RTU in early first half of 1970. And at that time, the, there was a hiatus between the uh, Rolling Thunder and linebacker operations in Vietnam. So those of us who graduated in that time frame stayed there in Kansas, uh, flying training missions in the THUD for a couple of years. Uh, then as uh, the linebacker operation picked up after the spring offensive in Vietnam, uh, we started getting orders to go over uh, with the senior officers going first. And um, because of my seniority, I was one of the last uh, to get over there. Um, I, fir I flew my first combat mission uh, in August of 1972 uh, and uh, flew for um, you know, about six months combat, uh, ended up with 80, 80 combat missions, 69 over North Vietnam. Uh, that's on the low side because of the, uh, you know, because of the timing for me, uh, the, the other gentlemen have quite a bit more time. Uh, I, after the, uh, after the uh, war, I, I did separate from active duty and I flew Air Force Reserves uh, in Utah for about three years in, in the 105. Thanks, Fred. Paul? Paul Metz, uh, I was in the Air Force for 12 years, uh, flew the F-105, pretty much uh, what Fred had just described in terms of timing. I was there for the end of the war, I flew 68 missions. Um, I went from the Air Force to civilian test piloting uh, with Northrop and Lockheed. I've flown uh, 70 different aircraft types, 
and uh, have about 7,000 hours. Most of my time has been in fighters, uh, uh, oldest being uh, uh, F-86 and uh, newest being YF-23 and the F-22. Thanks, unlucky. Yeah, I'm Lucky Ekman. Uh, I've, uh, I first started flying the F-105 in 1965. Uh, got to McConnell and I told the wing commander to send me in, uh, boss, and he said, not so fast, Sprout. I got uh, three more months of flying, and then I went in with the 562nd uh, and flew strike missions there, uh, one and a half tours in strike missions through August of 66. Uh, and there I first became acquainted with the wild weasels as they came to uh, Tockley and got uh, basically uh, wiped out uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, a hiatus went to Geneva, Switzerland uh, on a scholarship and uh, taught at McConnell for quite a while. Uh, and then back into the weasels after I couldn't stand myself uh, for being uh, living in the lap of luxury in Switzerland while my friends were getting shot down and languishing in the Hanoi Hilton. I uh, got there in November of 71 and left in November of 72, so I missed the graduation exercise. Total flying experience is uh, about 4,000 hours in fighters, uh, 2,800 in the thud, um, uh, 500 in the F-4, uh, 400 in the F-16, uh, 100 hours in the uh, T-33 flying cadets around the Air Force Academy and 100 hours flying chase on C-130s. Um, but it's all been fast mover time. I'm dangerous in a big airplane uh, and uh, still fly gliders uh, when I can. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. Total flight time now with the glider time is around 5,500 hours. Thanks, Lucky. So, so it sounds like, so you, you were there in, in 66, Lucky, from a, a wild weasel point of view. Um, and then does everybody else, was everybody else then there sort of 71, 72? Is that what I'm, is that what I'm sort of getting? Is that correct? Well, yes. I, I will say that I got there just as the linebacker campaign started in April of 72 and was there to the end of the war. So uh, I, I covered basically start to finish linebacker one linebacker two yeah. and and et what were your dates for in the in the thud the uh, november 71 to the august of 72 time frame basically just linebacker one okay. can we do this then um can we start maybe initially lucky with with you discussing or just talking a little bit about what the wild weasel program looked like when you uh, sort of came across it then in, in that sort of 66 time frame it, uh, my, my understanding is that it really only began in 65 or so um, so it was nascent I mean it was in its early years at that point um, how mature was it what did it look like sure be happy to uh, there was a notorious mission in July of 65 when we sent most of the thugs in Southeast Asia uh, against uh, two SAM sites that turned out to be dummies and lost six airplanes. That was the spring high mission. You can look it up online. Uh, that was not successful because the sites were dummy. They were flak traps. Uh, and uh, from then on, it appeared that it was game on between the F-105 and the service to air missile systems. Uh, fast forward to about September of uh, 65, and we had a Navy A-4 pilot come over from the Riskity, uh, brought his own uh, uh, snake eyes with him, uh, and he led eight thuds from uh, Tak Lee against uh, two SAM sites in uh, North Vietnam and uh, uh, got two SAM site kills, but uh, he himself was killed when he went across the SAM site at Snake Eye Height, which is, you know, is about 500 knots and about below 500 feet, and the AAA battery shredded him. Uh, but then uh, shortly thereafter, the weasels over at Karat uh, claimed their first kill, and those were the F-100 weasels under Gary Willard. Uh, came back uh, for the second half of my first tour and a half, uh, and about that time in the April-May time frame, the weasels started arriving, and I think there were uh, uh, 
six airplanes and eight crews that each went to Karat and Takli. Uh, the ones that came to my squadron at, uh, at Takli uh, quickly lost uh, of three and a half to four airplanes and one rendered non-flyable. So they were basically out of business and they had three and a half crews not recovered uh, as they were trying to sort out the tactics. So those are the guys on whose shoulders we stand. The guys at Karat did a little bit better. Uh, and so uh, finished up my strike tour, uh, uh, flew one or two uh, Iron Hand missions, but not with the, uh, not with the weasels and then went back and instructed to McConnell. Uh, and uh, so I, I saw people go through, go through the weasel school. Uh, and uh, a lot of the people that ended up in the Hanoi Hilton were my students. Uh, and then off to Switzerland for two years, goofing off and getting the master's degree. Uh, and then uh, uh, friend Ted Reese down at the personnel center said, hey, I got a deal for you. I'll send you back as a weasel. And I said, I got it, I'll take it. Uh, and uh, so showed up at uh, Nellis with uh, E.T. Johnson and uh, Dick Smith and uh, Mike Vasilovic and, and some of the others there. Uh, and we went in and we got there just in time for things to really start warming up because in the November, December time frame, on through April, the North Vietnamese had built up their entire uh, main force army in the lower packages, group package one specifically, and to protect them, they'd moved the majority of their 31 SAM battalions into that area. And so all of the, all of the weather was really bad and we could not uh, uh, see them to strike them visually. Uh, we had a lot of weasel activity uh, up to the beginning of linebacker, which uh, started basically a month after the North Vietnamese main force invasion started in, in April, uh, we had uh, a, a uh, several missions and it opened up the, the northern packages, uh, route back six, route back five uh, to us. But linebacker uh, one started on 10 May uh, and uh, was fights on. What was interesting about all that was during the three years of relative hiatus with bombing halts and uh, restricted uh, uh, territorial uh, access to North Vietnam, uh, we went to school and so did the North Vietnamese and they incorporated what came to be known later, we didn't realize at the time, was the Russian integrated air defense system. That was what they learned. What we learned in the weasels was, uh, thanks to Ed Rock, who, who really should be given this spiel, uh, was uh, we, got to, we took the F-105F which was a pretty good weasel, but had to use an outboard station for a jamming pod. And we put two uh, ALQ-105 jamming pods on this, on the, in cheeks on the side of the airplane above the bomb bay and uh, incorporated the AGM-78, which was a long reach uh, anti-radiation missile. Uh, and so we had tricks of our own and Ed can, Ed can describe differences, I think, between the early, uh, uh, gear in the backseat and uh, how much more intelligence, real-time intelligence we were able to gather in the G. But we, it was fight song with the best the enemy had, fight song with the best we had, uh, and it really got rolling in, uh, in May of uh, 1972, continued through the uh, cessation or rollback of linebacker in the October timeframe when the Paris peace talks were beginning to throttle what we could do in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I went home in, in November. Going back then to those early weasel missions, do, do you remember the name of the A4, Navy A4 guy? Yes, yeah, Skip Powers. Uh, he was off the Oriskany, and he, uh, he, he came over with a full load of uh, snake eyes, uh, and uh, he was the XO for one of their A4 squadrons on the Oriskany, uh, and uh, after he led that mission, we, we had... Uh, uh, four 105s from my squadron. I wasn't on that mission, and four 105s from the uh, 334th or th 333rd, I think, uh, out of Seymour Johnson. And uh, he went right across one site and they shredded him, and our, our guys popped up and got that site. Meanwhile, another supporting site came up, and the guys from Seymour got the other site. So the first, the first real SAM kills 
were really not done by wild weasels, but were done by what came to be uh, called iron hands with the pathfinder and with uh, bomb carrying airplanes in trail. So how, how do you define iron hand then? I mean, you've, you've iron hand is, into is basically but... where a, a smart airplane leads dumb airplanes and probably dumb fighter pilots were going along with it uh, in search of in search of SAM sites. Initially, we didn't have enough war gear and all the, uh, all the D-bottle airplanes. So with the few ones that we had were put in the lead and they could, much as Skip Powers has done, had done, uh, ferret out where the signals were coming from and point, the, point us towards the uh, SAM sites uh, and the people following along uh, would uh, pop up and, and drop hard bombs on their heads. Uh, and so that, that was Iron Hand uh, once the wild weasels got going, uh, then there was uh, less of the Iron Hand activity and more of the basically weasel support mission. What about the the threat then at that point? I mean, we, we, I, I'm definitely interested in, in in getting ET to talk a little bit about the the technicalities of the F one hundred five F and the G and and what was happening in terms of what you could do, what signals you could receive and and uh, interpret. But at that point in time, so that sort of 66 or so time frame, uh, what, what was the threat? SA-2, AAA, um, what did you know about it? It was, uh, it was SA-2. SA-2 scared us and drove us low. AAA chewed us up. Most of our losses went to, went to AAA and even small arms fire as we tried the European technique of going ever lower. Uh, and when you're ever lower, a 12-year-old girl with a 15-year-old uh, uh, manual rifle can put holes in your airplane and not the F-105 like modern, all of the modern airplanes doesn't take kindly to having holes in it. Did you, did you really know anything about the, the missile system at the time? Uh, only we had an expert in the squadron who knew things about our raw gear, radar, homing and warning gear, which were, was then the APR 25, uh, 26. Uh, and uh, so we knew something of how the fan song functioned, uh, you know, an azimuth and an elevation uh, scan that gave the distinctive rattlesnake uh, chirp. I must confess as a wingman there on my early missions, I never heard that because I never got to fly an airplane with the gear installed. And I flew with uh, several flight leaders when I asked them uh, after a particularly interesting mission, uh, what'd you see on the raw gear? And he said, oh, that thing was making so much noise, I just turned it off. <laughs> what, what then, when, when you returned then in, in that sort of 72 time frame, um, you returned to the mission from Switzerland, what were the obvious differences um, that had elapsed? I mean, again, you just referenced the fact you, you, had, um, you, you had been, you know, the US military had been learning, the North Vietnamese had been learning, but from a fighter pilot's point of view, what were the, the most obvious differences? Um, I think we were, we on our side were using more technology and less a bucket of balls uh, to, uh, to get the mission done. When we went through weasel school, we were schooled to uh, stand off and fling uh, uh, shrikes uh, into the environment uh, preemptively and use the standoff range of the AGM 78. I must say, parenthetically, and Fish can confirm this. Uh, I found that not to be terribly effective. One day I was supporting a Navy strike and I was on the uh, west, si west side of Hanoi and the Navy was coming in from the east side of Hanoi. The EA-6 jamming was so intense we couldn't see a darn thing and they lost two airplanes to SAMs. And after that experience, I realized that the whatever we'd been taught at Nellis was optimized to uh, for the survivability of the wild weasel, but wasn't terribly effective uh, in standoff unless you could somehow get the wild weasel between the surface terror missile site and its intended target. So after that, I uh, started going and sitting right on top of them. Uh, we were the only non-jamming airplanes in the sky unless we were actively on, uh, on the defense. And so the North Vietnamese would like to shoot at us. And sometimes our, our main function was to provide a non-jamming target to, for them to uh, release their frustrations on. Uh, and of course, they had jobs to do carrying bombs to targets and everything. 
And our job was to simply to contend with the SAMs however we could, either with missiles or later on with the Hunter Killer team with our F4 Dragon CBUs. Uh, and uh, so we we basically did. Uh, uh, a, f a friend of mine, uh, J.C. Meyer, uh, said that uh, we, as a friend, said, uh, in, if in the Olympics, in the Olympics of war, uh, the wild weasels are the javelin catchers. That's great. Uh, Steve? Yeah. Uh, this is Fred. Uh, if, if I could digress with a question, I think hopefully germane to your, um, to your uh, thread of thought here. I, I, I wanted to ask uh, Lucky, uh, you talked about, uh, and we know most of the losses were AAA, maybe small arms. I have been- um, Unknown caller. I'm sorry. I have been told that the uh, THUD was particularly vulnerable relative to other fighters uh, because of the original design that the hydraulic systems were relatively exposed. Uh, in, in your knowledge or experience, uh, was the THUD particularly, particularly uh, susceptible to small arms relative to the other fighters? Um, well, I don't know about the other fighters, but our susceptibility was in the aft section. Uh, where all the hydraulic lines ran and the fuel lines. Uh, I had one mission that I came back from where the uh, uh, main fuel manifold had taken a, a big hole in it and basically drained the airplane by the time I got it on the ground in New Dorn. Uh, they, uh, if you recall, in the very early days of the flight, it was gear up, flaps up, blow up because the uh, short saber drain was allowing fuel to re-enter the mm -hmm. aft end of the airplane and it was getting in around the hot afterburner components and causing uh, fires and explosions. They solved that problem by putting the uh, safety pack two cooling ducts on the back, the big ears are on either side of the uh, uh, aft section. Uh, and so, and I was flying one of those airplanes the day that, the, uh, that I got the hole in the main fuel manifold. So I didn't turn into a blowtorch, I just turned into a big leaker. But, uh, uh, and, and later on the site, as you will recall, uh, incorporated a get me home set of hydraulic systems where you could lock the stabilator, uh, fly with rudder pressure and, and fly between, I think it was 350 and 400 knots and control the airplane uh, basically uh, with power and with rudder to get you a place where you could bail out. You couldn't land with it, but it was basically locking out the hydraulic systems because they were, they were interlocked, ran, to, ran together and would uh, bleed together at the same time or get wiped out by a fire, a common fire. Okay then, so, so just to open the, the forum more widely then, um, what, one of the things that I'm curious about is of course, there's this Monica, you, you've, got to, you've got to be fucking shitting me about the mission, um, which obviously encapsulates, encapsulates quite well the reaction that people have to that. Um, you were all military aviators. You all knew what you were signing up for. Um, but when you heard that you were going to be going to the Wild Weasel mission or you know, returning to it, I think, Lucky, we, we already know how you felt about it. But was there any sense of trepidation around it? Was there any sense of, uh, was there any immediate um, instinctive reaction based on self-preservation, which was, well, I'd rather be doing something else? Hmm. And anybody can answer that question. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can tell you that, like most of my contemporaries, and Paul will probably verify this, you know, we were looking for our opportunities to go fly combat because, as been mentioned earlier, we got into that, that break period where they were pulling 105s out of Southeast Asia, just leaving the weasels, and us who were pipelined to go got got stopped and, and stayed and flew operational F-105s at McConnell for a while until as things heated up in the early part of 72, uh, they, they needed fresh blood. And by then most of us had a 500 hours and were flight leads. And so we all went over there. I had read Thud Ridge. I'd heard all the stories, everybody that were my, my, idols and trainers at McConnell all had a hundred missions and I heard all the stories. 
but I was thinking, well, things are different now. You know, we're not going north and it's not like it was in the 60s. And so when I got my chance and went to weasel school and then to jungle survival school at, at uh, Clark, while I was there was when they sent the first, I, I think the first big B-52 mission up into the Haiphong area. And, and the war was back on again. And I, and I got to thinking, holy shit, things have really changed. And now maybe I will be uh, looking at things the way that uh, were described to me for those guys who had flown earlier. And so to answer your question, yeah, I, my heart started beating fast. And, uh, and it didn't stop beating fast for a long time because uh, when I showed up at Karat, um, my best friend from uh, RTU, Al Matija, uh, who was there just a month or two earlier than me, he got into the first weasel class for, for my contemporaries. He met me at the C-130 and, and showed me around the base, took me to my hooch and says, I got to go. I got a big mission tonight and I got to get some rest. And that was the last time I saw him because he was shot down that night. So I haven't even flown a mission yet. And I went from, oh, this is going to be fairly straightforward. You know, we're just hanging around Laos and South Vietnam. And now the balloon had gone up and we're going north. And all those visions of uh, the books that I've read and the stories that I've heard were, were coming true. And, and I also lost my best friend. That's how I started my tour. Well, my tour started four months later than Fish. And by then they were embroiled, this is August. And uh, so we, we knew, my uh, class of five knew that uh, it was gonna be a, a hot war when we got over there. So uh, yeah, I uh, was like Fish and like the rest of them. If you aren't uh, scared, you're probably dead. And uh, so <laughs> we knew what we were getting into. Um, I think when we're lucky, I think when you and I went through uh, through 105G training there at Nellis, I think at that time, most of the instructors were saying, we're not even sure why we're training you. The war is basically on the downhill, really not much going on. And that was true. There really wasn't much going on. So I was kind of naive. I was I was a, had been in the Air Force already three years and was an engineer prior to that. So I really didn't have any flying experience. And this is my first flying assignment. It was probably kind of naive that the training's pretty good. The war's not too hot right now. No, I had been over TDY to help holes in a bunch out a couple of times and all that sort of stuff as an engineer. And I'd seen what was going on during the time of the 66, 67 time frame. So I knew what it was about. I'd been to Nellis and saw all the slides you know, the pictures in the, in the weasel school where they'd show all the names of X's cross and where they didn't come back. So I was aware that there was danger out there, but I think it was a little naive at the time. I thought we can handle this. We've been trained to Nellis. We can handle anything. <laughs> and then like Lucky says, uh, I got there in November and things started heating up and hell, I think we lost uh, Bob. Uh, oh. Bob Belli. Bob Belli and we get past there in like December. Scotty, Scotty McIntyre. Scotty McIntyre hung from the hope. Yeah, that was that was bad. Anyhow, kind of started up. So we got into a kind of slow. And most most of my flying during that time frame was probably nighttime. And up until April, we did a lot of Chapone patrol over in Laos. So things were pretty quiet. Nobody shooting at us, really not going to the north very much. And then one day they said, hey, you're going north and it's going to be in the daytime. And that's when everybody started getting notice of this is going to be a different world. Daytime is a different world when people are shooting at you. It, uh, one, you can't see it coming off the ground. You can't see anything, really. Whereas at nighttime, you're kind of, it's, uh, you can see things happening a little bit better when something's coming off the ground, even though it may be harder for you, lucky, to try and avoid because it's probably harder to judge <laughs> where the telephone pole is going in the daytime, in the nighttime. But anyhow, I think I was kind of naive at the time. I thought this will be a piece of cake, not, not a big deal at all until uh, linebacker one really started kicking off and that got your attention. Well, and you had to fly with Tom Cody. <laughs> there was that. <laughs> <laughs> but I started out with Bob Bell and he was like, I don't know, I don't know what his background was. <coughs> he was an instructor pilot. 
And from the time we got in the, walked out of the airplane, it was checklist all the way, not just reading it in your mind, but you had to have it out and going through it. And I said, man, I thought I gave that up when I left, left NAV school and EWO school and, and pre-NAV school at Del Rio. But uh, anyhow, he was, he was about a checkbook and, or checklist, I mean. I mean, that's, that's a, a good point, E.T. Obviously, from your point of view, you're not flying the aeroplane. And so you are completely in the hands of the pilot. Um, was there a, any sort of EWO chatter around who was a good guy to fly with or you know, who, who, who maybe you would prefer not to fly with? And, and I'm not asking for names, but I just mean generally, were there guys that you would prefer to fly with because you, you knew they were more capable or, or perhaps better or more trusted? I don't think there was anybody I said I never wanted to fly with. Uh, I was a, I was kind of a bastard bear when we got to know us. There was a five of us. I was the only I was a, a spare bear in a way, so I didn't have a crude pilot. Uh, Lucky was crude, and uh, and so was uh, Dick Smith with uh, Sam Davis. But uh, so I was all alone. So when I got to the squadron, I didn't have a, a steady crude pilot that I flew with the whole time. When I go look at my uh, my uh, flying log, I flew with just about everybody. Uh, but focused with Tom Cody towards when the linebacker stuff started. That was my primary uh, primary guy to fly with. Uh, you knew of guys in the squadron that, man, they would go and you'd hear recordings later on of what went on. And uh, I mean, you you knew if you knew if you were going to fly with somebody, whether they were aggressive or not aggressive, that sort of thing. Uh, but I didn't really have any concerns about flying anybody. Uh, I think at that point in time, though, there were all the most of the pilots were old heads had been there before, like Lucky. Uh, so from that standpoint, they've seen it, done it, that sort of thing. Um, and on the on the bear side, I guess we were probably more of a, a first timer bunch. A lot of people came in from 52s. Uh, uh, Mike Mike Basilovac and I both came out of the non flying world. We'd all we'd never neither of us had flown for the first three or four years in the Air Force. We've been on a different, different career paths before we finally got into the NAV and EWO school. Both of us asking for 105s and not realizing what we're going to get into, but we didn't want to go to 52s. We didn't want to go to EV-66s, and we didn't want to go to, I think they called them DC-130s at the time and didn't have a clue what they did and nobody could tell us, so we didn't want to go there. And luckily, I think we both had some, I don't even remember what we both got initially in EWO school. Uh, and then one day they came and says, hey, by the way, you guys, uh, you lost your airplane. Do you have to go to 105s? And we said, yes, because that's where we wanted to go. I think we'd been around long enough to at least know the, the fighter world was a, the place to be. Well, one thing that I've, I've observed over the years, talking to um, crude, crude air crew, um, you know, air crew, flight, flight crew, crude aircraft, is that uh, an SR-71, F-15E, that kind of thing, um, is that if you're hard crewed over a period of time, you are you become in sync with it in sync with each other so they the person in the back or on the front doing things without you really even having to tell them and, and so you so you you become a single entity if you will did that happen then in the um, f-105 uh, in, in the wild weasel mission and and how important was that kind of synchronicity or or sort of sixth sense or whatever you want to call it absolutely I, let me tell a story on my old friends dick smith and uh, sam davis they were flying one day over uh, by the uh, route package one, and all of a sudden, uh, Sam Davis let out a big arg from the back seat. And so Dick Smith went into his no tally Sam break. And so he's all over the sky, afterburner, pulling lots of Gs. And uh, finally, Sam said, what are you doing? And he says, I'm dodging whatever it is that made you say arg. He said, well, that was a spider that came up and bit me. But, but it was that degree of of integration, if if uh, if the other crew member hiccuped or said "uh oh," uh, then you immediately knew that you had something you needed to work on, and that's why uh, things worked so well with Mike. He would tell me exactly what he was thinking, and if he didn't wasn't talking, I still knew what he was thinking. Uh, yeah, I can tell you that um, uh, you're fortunate. Uh, be crude with somebody that you learn to work with and, and respect well like that. But that wasn't the case for me. I, I found myself with uh, uh, different crew members all the time. I never really got crewed up with anybody. And I got crewed up with some really great EWOs. And I got crewed up with some EWOs 
that uh, uh, I wasn't really happy with. I, I don't know if you remember Death Bear. <laughs> Death Bear eventually went AWOL, but the guy was hard of hearing. And come on, ET, you can verify that if you can't hear what's going on with all your analysis equipment, you're not you're not able to do your job, right? Yeah, that's uh, fortunately he went a wall, and I got another bear. And like I said, I flew with some really good ones, and uh, but I flew with a lot of different ones. And and I wish I'd had the opportunity to be paired with a, a good bear and stay with him because that kind of synergy is priceless. And I agree with what Lucky says: if you've got it, it makes a difference. Yeah. So, Steve, um, you one of the uh, lessons learned that that I was thinking about was the 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 way that the uh, Ewos, the bears, and the pilots got uh, got uh, what so called married up. Uh, Gary Willard had uh, commented that uh, the process was to uh, let the let them uh, choose their choose ourselves, and uh, and basically that would happen in the bar. You know, when, when before you got. Uh, started flying. Uh, I think that was a very good process. And in my case, uh, I was lucky. I, I got uh, paired up with a very compatible bear right away. And I think that happened quite a bit. But uh, just to, you know, reinforce what everybody has uh, said, the uh, the ability to communicate with, with somebody and, and, and really be kind of um, in tune with each other uh, from a communications point of view, a temperament, uh, was very valuable and essential, and uh, I think when you had it, uh, it, it was it was very good. And uh, the the pilot Ewo interface, the, the integration of that is just absolutely critical. I'm just saying what everybody knows, but uh, I, I think the uh, the Air Force was wise to uh, to allow the uh, crews to pair up uh, naturally the way that they they saw fit. So that's it. Thanks. Well, and one more thing. Uh, if you were flying with a bear that you knew uh, and had flown with before as a pilot, that tended to make you a lot braver, much to the disgust of the bear, probably. But uh, we, uh, you know, we had confidence that we could take on anything that, uh, that was thrown at us. Now, bear in mind, we lost uh, in, from November 70. 71 to the end of the war, we lost 10 wild weasels over there. So it wasn't a cakewalk. Uh, and we had some really hard lessons like, uh, like Fish did with his friend Almatia and O.C. Jones over, over Haiphong that night. Uh, and uh, Bob Belli and, and Scotty McIntyre and others whom I could name, obviously, uh, Jim O'Neill and my bear when I was on R&R. &R. So yeah, uh, you, uh, you came to rely on, uh, on the uh, communications ability of the Bayer who was getting you real-time information. But we also had the APR 3536. And so I used that as an attack scope very often for launching the Shrike. I could uh, see a, a signal come up on the 3536, judge a signal strength, uh, turn hard and fling a Shrike at him to try to force him out, off the air. Uh, and uh, before the bear could tell me much about it. And so a lot of what we did was just pure suppression, uh, trying to scare them off the air and get, the, get them looking at us. Can we talk about that then? That's, uh, uh, I think, an element of the, um, the history of the, the weasels that's not particularly well known. And so, so what is the contract between bear and pilot? You know, if, if you've got a situation like that where, where you get a pop-up threat, as a pilot, are you supposed to wait for the bear to tell you whether you know it might be some kind of faint, or if there's another signal somewhere that maybe you're not seeing on your scope at the front, or are you going to just go and shoot it as as you've just described? I guess it depends on how how big a threat it is, uh, how many rings, what signal strength you're seeing, and where you are over the terrain, and where you know the SAM sites to have been. Now, bear in mind there were 31 SAM battalions in North Vietnam and 200 pre-prepared SAM sites. So it was a real pee and shell game. Uh, and so uh, study as we might and look at the SR-71 photographer, the photography as we might, we never knew day from one day to the other 
which sites would be active. And they would, uh, they had a mode where they would shoot from a site, a pre-prepared site, and then move immediately. So if it was active yesterday, it's not going to be active today. I always planned my missions around what I thought to be the active sites. Uh, and one in 135 weasel missions north uh, did it turn out that way. All the others uh, in about the first 40, 15 or 45 seconds, I realized it was not as I had gotten from intelligence and it was an ad hoc reaction to the threats as we saw them on the ground, which made it kind of neat because nobody in Saigon could predict for me where I needed to go and what I needed to do. And at the same time, that lack of predictability as I was reacting to the threats made the MiGs not a big problem for us. As long as you kept your speed up, uh, the MiGs were, uh, were, were not a big threat. Actually, in some cases, the MiGs were a lesser threat than our F-4 guys who were really hungry for MiGs. I had one uh, 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 Sparrow AIM-7 shot at me by a, uh, a MiG hungry of white league, John Madden. Uh, and uh, uh, because I tossed a shrike over the strike force and he didn't think that was nice behavior. Uh, fortunately, he realized his mistake and he broke a lock and uh, the spar sparrow went stupid, but many of them did. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, it was it was uh, all the fog of war that you can imagine. Uh, I, I, I've got to throw in a, a short story because uh, you may not know, but I was uh, in Lucky's flight. He was my flight commander the whole time he was there and for the most of my um, tour there. And we were on a mission over the north and we, we covered the strike force and we were egressing towards the Gulf. And there was chatter, radio chatter on the strike frequency. And maybe this was something that you'd learned lucky from your experience that you just described, but you heard these F4s talking and it, seemed like maybe they were talking about us because they were pointing out, hey, you know, left one o'clock low, you know, you know, pointing <laughs> out. And, and I think your comment on the radio after you said jettison and burner, and we started going 700 knots, and you said something on the radio like, hey, if these MIG-like airplanes have pointy noses doing 700 knots. We're F-105s. <laughs> and we out over the Gulf. That's exactly right. That was over Little Thud Ridge. And some yeah. MIG-hungry MIG hung F-4s started to uh, roll off the perch on us. And I looked back up at them. And I said, oh, they, they think we're MIG-17s or MIG-21s, but nobody's got a pointy nose like us. Exactly. That's exactly where we were, too. Um, glad you verified my story. I can't be sure at my old age, you know. Yeah. So, Steve, uh, to your to your question about the uh, pilot and bear interface as you're going going about uh, the dynamics of the mission, um, I think uh, just reflecting, I, I I think the uh, context has some bearing on that. For example, you know, the bears talking to you uh, as you go along. It, and uh, particularly, I'm thinking a, a linebacker too, where uh, we weren't seeing a lot of signals. So, uh, but the bear's telling you, telling uh, you know what signals he is getting, what he's not. So that that kind of informs the pilot's decision about you know whether they're, uh, at least in my experience, whether I was uh, ready to uh, shoot off a strike or not. Um, so so that background. Um, is, is informational, but um, the other thing is the the standard arm. Uh, when you're carrying that, of course, that that's very integrated. The the bear is uh, more or less in command of that. It certainly is in control of it in in terms of getting it locked up and uh, and clearing uh, the pilot uh, to fire. So that that that's pretty much a you know purely collaborative effort that the pilot would never do on his own. Uh, but I, I'm not. Uh, also, don't want to uh, kind of crowd out ET here. It'd be interesting to hear his perspective on it. Yeah, one of the things that uh, that we used a lot in the 105 that sadly you couldn't do in the in the F4 and can't do in the F16 either, and probably not the F35 is uh, use your ears. We had the good receivers, 
lucky you used the RWR because it was the only thing you had up front that gave you some visual and, and uh, some audio and whatnot. But it's just like on a radio when you're kind of tuning through and if you get your game control just such, or if you use, use your push button to go to this channel or this channel or to scan through, the, the noise level is set such that it's just going to go bypass signals that may be actually out there. In the back seat, we could take the APR 35 and I cut the, cut the tips of my gloves off so I could have a good, good touch feel on the, on the controls and heads out of the cockpit, but the, but the fingers are going back and forth, scanning up and down the frequencies of the threats we were looking for. And if you have the game control down low enough, you might pick something up the RWR is never going to see. So at least you might have a little forewarning there. Is there something there? There's a little tickle there. And it was all by ear. Uh, you may, if you're looking at your scope, you might have seen something, but that's not worth, you weren't going to see much if you just glued to your scope all the time, which would kill you if you just kept your eyes inside the cockpit the whole time. That's kind of why uh, Deaf Bear is not a good call sign. <laughs> 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 how, do you, how do you get through Evo school? That was one of the main courses. You had to be able to tell about 50 different radars by sound. <laughs> I don't know, but that's who I got paired with. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, so ET, anyway, just... They did away with that audio in a lot of the follow-on uh, systems, and it's kind of too bad because that's one of the things I depended on then. Now, granted, they got other avionics capabilities that we didn't have back then that I wished I had. But, uh, anyhow. So can you just give us a, a quick 101 then on on what you were doing? You, you've just alluded to, to, you know, sort of going through different frequencies and listening to them. But so the SA2 is operating on a certain set of frequencies. You're trying to find what they are, and then that's going to allow you to do what? Well, if nothing else, it tells you that it's there. <clears throat> you can tune to it and try and see if you can break out the signal. And based upon... Uh, one of the scopes we have get an idea whether he's left ear, right ear, behind you, or whatever, uh, based upon where you had, where you thought the SAM sites were from, from an intel perspective. There, you've got them already charted on your on your map to go and get an idea of, of uh, where they might be. So situational awareness would give you an idea of is that something just way off in the distance, just tickling around, playing games, or is that something that we're going to be going towards? It's going to be of importance to either us as a target, us being the target, or is it gonna be something that's gonna be uh, targeting uh, whoever we're supporting, whether it be a flight of F-4s or B-52 uh, sorties or whatever. So it's kind of a situation awareness. I know he's out there from a directional standpoint and say, hey, this is way off to the left, all my activity, this mission's to the right. That's where my, uh, the strike five flights are gonna go, where the B-52s are gonna strike. And so you'd say, maybe I'll ignore that thing if I kind of, figure he's out off to the left. Uh, if he's off to the right where we're going, obviously I don't know what the range is unless there's a, you know, the intensity of the signal we're receiving. So you kind of take all that into account of where you are now, where you think you know the threats might be, where your target is or where the target is you're supporting, where your strikers are, whether it be 52s or F4s or whatever. And it's just kind of you know, and, and let your frog know that, hey, this is what's going on. And you both kind of compare notes and go from there. And you don't sort of go, you know, throwing, throwing missiles in the air just for the heck of it. And every once in a while you might. The ROE may not allow you to, but hey, I remember linebacker one, we were kind of heading so many degrees every day, another five degrees. I don't remember if it was five or 10 degrees every day. We'd go a little bit further north was the, was the authorization or ROE. And one day we just had some guy out there at Barlock that was just, he was just too good to be true. And we didn't think it was probably south of what our northernmost point was we were allowed to go, but we figured, hey, tomorrow we're going to go there anyhow. So <laughs> there goes a 78. <laughs> and the next day we did actually go further north. And I don't know if that guy was there or not. I didn't see him. Well, uh, he did anything or not, I have no idea. But. That's a very good point. The, uh, the integration of the IADs there in, in North Vietnam was heavily dependent on the bar lock, which could provide both azimuth and elevation and range uh, at uh, up to 200 miles. And so that was the glue that held the whole integrated air defense system together. And so whenever I got a chance and, and we had a strong uh, bar lock signal, I would, uh, I would try to take that out because if you took out the bar locks, 
that would force the uh, various elements, the MIGs, the SAMs, the AAA, force them all autonomous to what they could see out the window or what, could they, what they could see from spoon rests and some other lesser GCI capabilities. And so blinding that uh, integrated air defense system by taking out the Barlocks was a critical function that we performed in the Weasels in the 72 timeframe that they didn't have the ability to do in the earlier days. What then was the difference in, in terms of tactic or, or use case for the Shrike and the standard arm then? Why, you know, why, why two different missiles? What, what could one do that the other couldn't? Well, the 78 had a much, uh, much larger warhead and obviously could go quite a, quite a few miles further. It gave you the standoff if you really needed to get that sort of thing. Um, if, if they thought that you couldn't touch them, they might try a few things they wouldn't otherwise try. Uh, obviously, once they got to learn and figure out what the 78 could do and the distance it had and the capabilities it had, that uh, kind of lessened uh, your ability to kind of surprise them. But, you know, you get your new guy up there, and if he doesn't know better, you just never know. He may do something he isn't supposed to do and keep radiating for too long or from too far out or whatever, and you just might be able to engage him for a longer distance. And of course, with a bigger, bigger missile, it also had, you know, I guess it was a lot faster than the Shrike too, and had a few other things, had, had a few other things going for it from a, from a uh, uh, signal processing standpoint to hone in on a particular target versus just kind of a wide open, hey, have anything out in this frequency range kind of thing. Wasn't that the big uh, discriminator for the two weapons is the fact that the bear could tune to very specific frequencies on the 78. So you could have a wider variety of threats you could address. Whereas <clears throat> the strike was limited to a specific frequency. Right. And it was much narrow in terms of the number of weapons or number of any enemy weapons that could engage. Correct. You could narrow down to that specific frequency of a specific SAM site or Barlock or whatever it may be. And it would ignore as long as the guy wasn't, you know, overlapping frequency wise. If he was over here, you could narrow it down to just the one you wanted to go after. And there was a big difference in the kinematics. Uh, the Shrike was basically a Sparrow airframe, about 400 pounds, uh, and therefore had the limitations of those 400 pounds. Uh, and uh, if a signal went off the air, it was a, a, dumb, a dumb round whereas the AGM-78 weighed about 1,200 pounds uh, and could go 65 miles. And uh, uh, one time I dropped off a tanker uh, uh, up over the Gulf of Tonkin, and um, maybe you guys remember this, but uh, uh, I was a spare, air spare, but I was toting an AGM-78 and it looked like a big day and the bar rocks were up all over the place. And so Mike and I turned inbound and went feet dry uh, climbed to 26,000 feet, 0.95 Mach, and let fly with the AGM-78 at some unsuspecting bar lock that was looking the other way. Uh, with, uh, uh, and then I had to explain it when I got back on the ground why the spare expended. <laughs> and the uh, next day, they, I, next day I, they came out with rules that said spares may expend. So, uh, you know, I, I have uh, a more kind of a pilot perspective on the AGM-78. Um, uh, everything that's been said so far concerning we'd like to expend it against Barlocks because that would, uh, that, that would definitely hurt their integrated air defense system. So as a pilot, I would just pray that there would be a Barlock on the air as I'm going into North Vietnam because <laughs> Like Lucky said, that sucker weighs 1,200 pounds, and with the uh, with the rackets on and everything, and on the opposite wing, a 450 gallon fuel tank that gets drained dry. If you don't expend that weapon, you come home with a 1,500 pound asymmetric imbalance in your airplane. And all you guys that are on this video who remember flying the F-105, G. Final approach was 200 plus fuel, right? Plus or minus a knot or two. And when you get home with an AGM-78 in the middle of the night at an empty 450, 
your final approach speed was like 230 knots on a 9,000 foot runway, and that was not fun. So I always wanted to see a bar lock and shoot my AGM 78. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yep. Just just piggybacking on that, it was it was nice to be able if you got a good shot on anything with that with that uh, big monster out there. It was it was not a lot of fun flying around. I, I can't remember if it was aileron or rudder, but you had to put a lot of trim in there just to keep the thing straight and level too. Yeah. And by the way, if your final approach speed is two hundred and thirty knots, and the tire failure speed is two hundred and sixteen knots and the drag shoot failure speed is 200 knots, and you're landing in a black hole at one end of the runway <laughs> at, uh, at Karat, uh, it could get a little sporty. Yeah. Thank goodness for a good drag shoot. <laughs> yeah. Don't have one. By the way, I don't know whether you guys remember. Burn up some tires. <laughs> I don't know whether you guys remember or not, but each airplane had been modified so much over time that each airplane had a unique final approach speed and they took a Dymo label maker and stuck it up above the airspeed indicator. So 213 was one airplane, I remember, and 204 and 206. Every yeah. airplane had a unique final approach speed minus, that's without fuel. So you had to add fuel and more knots for fuel. Right. Each one was a unique entity. I, I can tell you today, I've talked, you know, for 15 years, I was in fighter requirements at Air Combat Command and lots of young fighter pilots coming through, F-15, F-16 guys. When I tell them what I flew final approach at in the F-105, they just knew I was lying. <laughs> it's absolutely true. <laughs> when I left Karat, I went straight to uh, RF Bentwaters Woodbridge, straight into F-4, didn't go to RTU or anything. And the first flight in the F-4, I thought we were going to crash on landing because they were just going so damn slow. It was <laughs> kind of terrifying for the back seat. Until you got used to it. What about, uh, you sort of reference shooting at these sites and not necessarily knowing whether um, you scored a kinetic kill, let's say. What was what? I mean, what were you trying to do? Obviously, the the idea is to stop them from shooting down your um, bomber force, or your fighter force, or the people you're protecting. But but really, was it good enough to just push them off the air? Did you actually want to kill them? Because presumably, the next day you'd have to come back and, and deal with them again anyway. Well, that's always been a fight forever. I mean, and it's going on today in the F-16 world. You know, do you bomb them or do you scare them? Kind of routine, or you suppress them? And everybody wants to go out and hair on fire and, and drop bombs on and kill them. And sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. It just depends. Uh, we lost a lot of airplanes going out and trying to bomb and kill them. You know, we've lost a lot of airplanes in a lot of ways, but AAA is one. But trying to get down there low and fast with uh, dropping bombs will kill just as many, uh, drop as many airplanes as, as not. So it's kind of one of those happy mixes and how much fear you can put into them on the ground, how much fear they have of you, uh, whether luck's on your side. And, you know, so there's, there's room for both, I guess. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get away from having some sort of a standoff weapon uh, from a missile kind of standpoint. And obviously it's better to go out and kill it because you're right. For all you know, they're still all there the next day and Intel's never going to tell you because they don't know and probably even won't know until after the war is over. And even then, it'll probably be too classified to tell you that what you did. I, uh, I like going after the bar locks because I was fairly convinced that if there were any Russians in North Vietnam, they were in those bar lock bands. And I felt like I needed to get my licks in on the Russians in preparation for, uh, should the Cold War ever turn hot. What, what did you think about the Russians then, uh, in terms of the fact that they were manning these these radar bands, they were providing that support? Um, well, I guess there's two levels of consideration, isn't there? The first is from a leadership point of view. You know, it, the Vietnam um, Air War is infamous for being, um, you know, dominated by political interference, you know, target sets being decided, weapons being decided, all those sorts of things by people who are politicians uh, rather than aviators. But, but was there a consideration from a leadership point of view and then at a, a sort of a, a, a pilot or a, a bear perspective, was there any consideration given to whether or not you might be taking out a Russian? 
Yeah, we were never told to avoid the Russians. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing uh, because uh, we had a pretty good idea where they were. They were they were the glue initially that held that integrated air defense system together. And they were making some of the judgment calls of how, of how to commit the SAM sites uh, in, the, in the array that they had for that day. So they were initially the tacticians. Towards the end, I got the feeling that the North Vietnamese were in charge just as they had gotten in charge in the, in the surface to air missile vans. Initially, there were North Koreans and Chinese and Russians in those surface to air missile vans uh, and, and Russians. But uh, later on, it was all North Vietnamese they were pretty darn good at what they were doing. They were. Well, we probably could have done a better job of SAM suppression if we just got the SAMs while they were in port before they got unloaded. Uh, absolutely. Parenthetically, I, uh, I got sent to this tower one night to be soft all through the dark hours. And uh, this was probably June or so. We were partway into linebacker and we'd been trying to suppress, suppress, suppress. And it was getting frustrating because we didn't seem to be taking out their order of battle. And so I wrote an attack plan, master attack plan to basically go in there and kill the Lally, take all the fighter sorties on any given day and go in there and just strike all 200 of those pre-prepared sites and wipe them all out. Uh, that didn't get us much. Uh, that, uh, uh, I, I think that scared people down in Saigon because it was too aggressive and it was gonna uh, uh, up, up the ante in the war too much. But what it did get us was hunter killer teams. And the hunter killer teams, I think, worked out quite well, combining the capabilities of the F-4s, toting four by four air to air missiles and four by four, uh, four uh, CBU canisters. Uh, and the F-4 crews loved it because it was their chance to get a MIG. And if they wanted to spread CBUs over the North Vietnamese Delta, uh, the CBUs were a great weapon. And uh, and I saw it many times where they just uh, go across the SAM site and. I wreak all kinds of havoc. Can we talk a little about um, tactics then? So, so f firstly, maybe from the uh, the SAM operator's point of view, what sort of because I've heard about them being able to maybe sort of optically launch and then turn <laughs> a guidance radar on right at the last minute, um, uh, or, or to be able to burn through your jamming, or to be able to track or or home in on your jamming. What, what capabilities did they have that maybe you weren't aware of at the time? What sort of things were they doing to be successful? They had something called Dr. Pepper. Uh, I don't know if they called it Dr. Pepper uh, because I don't know if they had Dr. Pepper in North Vietnam, but it was 10, two and four, basically shoot at a target airplane from several diff different aspects. And the first missile was designed to capture your eyes and get you concentrating on dodging that missile. And the next missile or this uh, third missile was to take you out from three different sites. I did have that experience one day. A uh, missile was coming long shot to uh, coming across the Red River from about 15 miles away. And so I was getting up speed to, to dodge that when uh, a short range sh shot from a Fan Song F, which was optically guided, uh, blew up right in, under the tail of the airplane. Fortunately, uh, the missile was traveling fast. It was going about Mach two and a half or three, uh, and the missile's warhead bursted radially. So that conical radius of uh, shrapnel went all around the airplane. Uh, Bill Wyckoff, who saw it happen, said, "Those guys are dead." Uh, we weren't dead. We had a we had a hole in the utility hydraulic system, and that was it. But uh, uh, we never saw that one coming because uh, we were addressing a threat that was giving us a strobe and an shit light and uh, never saw the guy behind us. Of course, he had an shit light that he was lighting us up with, but we attributed the shit light as sector light to the, uh, to the guy that was shooting at us from a greater distance. So you, Lucky, you had another mission just like that, that you described, and I was on your wing. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you recall I mean they shot five Sams at us that day three from the north of Hanoi and the two that should have killed me were from the south I, I actually reported 
in the after mission brief that uh, an SA-2 missed me by less than 100 feet. And I got a call from 7th Air Force saying that can't be right because the lethal radius of an SA-2 is 300 feet. And I told him, I said, I didn't say it blew up 100 feet from me. I said it missed me by less than 100 feet. And there were two different kinds of way they blew them up. One was proximity and the other was command detonator. And the luck that I had that day was it was a command detonated missile and he was a millisecond late. So I, I'm all for luck. Well, uh, as I recall, you traded paint with that SA-2. Some of it, uh, some of that uh, Russian uh, paint ended up on your radar. That was the, the fifth missile. Okay, there, was, <laughs> there were three from the north and two from the south. And I'm, I'm going to tell on myself now because we've been watching out the right-hand side of our airplane at the 3 o'clock position, watching these three SAMs come over at us. And... I'm flying your wing and dude, you kept me safe. We, we did our thing, they overshot. And my backseater, and I wish I could remember his name said, Sam, nine o'clock. Well, I had, if he'd have said, Sam left nine o'clock, I would have looked left, but I looked right. <laughs> and I, on my tape, it says, I don't see him. <laughs> and about that time, an SA-2 roared underneath my nose. I think the booster was still attached, which kind of goes with your story. It was a short range shot underneath my nose. I felt the shock wave as it went by. I could see that the missile was camouflaged and it went off my right wing and it blew up. And I looked left nine o'clock and there was number two right on its tail but it wasn't guided as well and it guided out in front of me and I flew kind of right, right through the fireball. And that's when you pointed out in the, uh, uh, after you know the battle damage check as we were egressing at 700 knots that maybe I'd scrape some paint off the airplane. <laughs> it was fun flying on Lucky's wing, I gotta tell you. He didn't get that name lucky for no, no reason at all, it sounds like. <laughs> Apparently. When, uh, oh. when I graduated, when I left uh, Karat, the guys, guys gave me a map of, uh, of the 20 miles around Hanoi, and they labeled one of the big streets there Lucky Avenue, because I would go <laughs> sit right on top of them uh, and say, okay, shoot at us if you got to shoot at somebody. Uh, and... Uh, a lot of the people who flew with me didn't much appreciate that, but it seemed to work as long as you kept your speed up. And I mean fast, uh, above 600 knots, which meant you weren't the last out. You went in and you lit up the sky and you tried to grab their attention and you ran out of gas quick and you came out quick. So I got to tell you, I was wondering why we're still doing these big circles over Hanoi when we had no weapons left. And apparently <laughs> you didn't. And apparently you didn't know that. <laughs> Well, I hadn't kept good count, and I thought you had a shrike left, so we pulled up 30 degrees, nose high to a SAM site, to an active SAM site, and I said, yeah. shoot, shoot, and you said, Winchester, and I said, ah! <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's when we started being engaged, too, so. But from a tactic standpoint, sometimes that works. Maneuvers in a radio call can cause some guy on the ground to say, holy crap, they got us in the line, and they're shooting at us. Even though you may not have a weapon, they shut down. It was done back then. It's been done in the F-16 and F-4G world and probably the F-35s will try the same thing someday when they're Winchester and have no nothing else but a radio and maneuvers to do. And somebody's going to react to that, which is, if they react, that's fine. Well, and that's a good point. Uh, we were pretty confident that they were listening to our radio frequencies and reacting to what we were saying on the radio. So I used that uh, on at least one occasion to when a SAM site came up at three o'clock and we were egressing low on fuel and uh, a SAM site came up and was launching at us. And I said, I'm gonna go get a piece of that and turned into it and they pulled the plug. So Steve, uh, to, your, to your question about the, uh, the tracking, uh, um, I'll let, let Paul comment too about what he saw, but during linebacker two, uh, we were seeing a lot of missiles 
and uh, and not a lot of uh, classic uh, fan song guidance radars. Um, just to digress a second, the first two Sams that I ever saw were down in Route Pack One at night, and uh, and they just popped out of a cloud there at twelve o'clock, totally surprising us. Uh, the first indication that that other than seeing the thing uh, that we had a Sam airborne was a call from Red Crown. Uh, that there were that there were Sam Air, Sam's airborne, and you know they, you know they uh, aborted the the inbound buffs. Uh, there was a second incident later in November uh, up at Vin, where uh, we we also saw a straight up missile shot. Uh, again, with with uh, no signals, um, no classic signals. And, uh, and then, of course, we saw a lot of it uh, up in linebacker, too. Uh, so there, there are a couple of good uh, histories if folks haven't looked at them. Uh, one's uh, called the 11 Days of Christmas. Uh, that was by uh, Marshall Michael. I don't know if I pronounced that right. And then Carl Eschman wrote a book called Linebacker. Uh, both of those talk quite a bit about the issue of, of uh, how the Sams were, were being guided. Uh, you know, without the classic fan songs, uh, there, there seems still see, seems to be some uh, questioning about that. And I don't know if it may be ancient history and not germane to, to the current, but um, from a historical point of view, uh, it might be interesting to hear, uh, hear Paul and IT's, uh, uh, ET's view on that. One of, the, one of the questions is whether the uh, so-called I-band uh, radar, uh, I think it was 2809 or something like that, uh, whether that was being used or not. Uh, what are your gentlemen perspective on that? Yeah, I don't know. We saw, Tom and I saw one one day and we figured our careers had ended. It was in the RUPAC-1 supporting a buff, a buff uh, series of, uh, of airplanes coming through, usually a, three, a threesome. <clears throat> And we didn't see any signals either. And here come two, uh, two, two missiles out of the clouds. And we knew where the buff was. We could look up there and see them. And next thing we know, those things went off. Next thing you know, you get fuel coming out of the, out of the 52. And we figured, holy crap, this is our mission. We, they, got a, they got our airplanes we're supposed to be supporting. And we're going to watch the airplane go down at, at that. Luckily, all it did is uh, put a bunch of holes and they leaked a lot of fuel. They recovered it at Da Nang. And I think later, I think they had many rocket attacks on Da Nang trying to target that buff when it was on the ground. And we never really saw anything. I think we may have seen something of a guidance signal at the very end. But the thing is, the buff was, buffs are so very predictable. You know, they knew when they left and got on the bus at Guam, <clears throat> they knew when they took off, just everybody's on the phone saying, hey, they just took off. Uh, I can't remember the name of the organization that would go out of a guard and say, give a warning that, oh, by the way, in the next 30 minutes, there's going to be buff attacks in the such and such area because they want the friendlies to get out of the way. So the guys on the ground knew things were coming. They knew kind of the times and they knew the damn well the altitudes. One guy goes through and they definitely know the ass with the guys coming in if they hadn't figured it out already. And they probably get some jamming strobes and, and they just had a they just had some ways of being passively doing and throwing some missiles in the air and getting quite lucky, uh, so to speak. <laughs> well, during the uh, Christmas Wars, uh, at one point, I believe it was called a Dash 6 Shrike. Is that, that ring a bell to anybody? My and band, yeah. It was to, I think, handle the T-8209. Uh, and that it was a different frequency band. And once again, it illustrates the strike had to be tuned to a specific frequency against a specific threat. But uh, also during the Christmas Wars, uh, and I listened to my tape uh, from the 26th of December, um, I remarked several times in the tape that there's a salvo of six missiles coming up and we did not have signals from them. So it was, a, I assumed it was a ballistic launch and then the a terminal type of guidance uh, that they may have been using a bar lock to give them the corrections and then turn on the radar right at the last uh, before it hit the B-52s. So, but there was there was a surprising lack of signals during the Christmas War. Yeah, I agree with that 100. percent I, I was up there uh, on. I, I I suppose I only missed one or two of the missions during linebacker two, and 
the, the interesting thing other than the absolute fear that I felt the first night that I was going to go over downtown Hanoi in the middle of the night yeah. was that after I went there, I realized that everything that I saw Sam fired were going right up to 30 plus thousand feet and passing right by me <laughs> and never hardly ever got any classic uh, Sam guidance signals on my equipment, uh, but shot a lot of shrikes. Just at, at, at the time, it was uh, an undercast. And boy, when one of those things was going off, there would be a big glow on the ground. And you know, we'd roll in and shoot a shrike. <laughs> Just like a high bar. Yeah. You know, I, um, I think it varied also. I, I remember talking to Jim Terry one night. I told him, you know, I, we weren't seeing many signals. And, and he had an opposite. He said, opposite experience. He said, yeah, he's seeing fan songs. He was dip checking them and, and shooting at them. So I, I think it, it varied quite a bit. Did, did, did there, um, then in terms of the, the different tactics, was there sort of a fingerprint then of different operators? Did you, were there sort of, you know, na you know, names that you gave to different operators based on what they were doing? W was it that personal? Could you tell who you were up against based on what they were doing? I think linebacker one, when it first started off, you kind of got the feeling that the guys at the down south didn't have as much of a clue. But as days went by, you could see either, either more experienced seven level guys are coming in or, or they were just getting experienced in, on their own and, and learning how to, how to react. You know, as far as a mission control, you know, staying on a lot longer, they might need to uh, coming up too soon, those sorts of things. It may have been their coordination with bar locks and their offboard systems to say, hey, I'm going to stay silent and rely on you to tell me where he is before I turn on. Don't know, you know, which, what was really causing, but you got the feeling they were getting better and better. And luckily we were also, but at the same time, thankfully. So, so that you know, Lucky's mentioned it a few times. So, so the the idea behind IADS, you know, is that I suppose you have a multi-layered, uh, networked uh, set of systems that can you know be effective by working together as a team. Um, were they using a telephone line? Were they using a radio? If, if you had three sites, how how did they coordinate? What did you know about the way they um, affected their their tactics? I think that's probably knowable, but it wasn't uh, available to us as air crews. Uh, they basically, the Intel community had ways of tapping into their co communication systems and how they were coordinating, but they weren't telling us that because it was information that uh, was uh, perishable and sources and methods uh, 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 sensitive. And so they weren't telling us that. I think I think Red Crown was probably better at that because they had they didn't have a whole bunch of hills to look over, uh, and uh, and so I think Red Crown was better at that. But I think they were filtering out anything that they got through those sources, through those signals, intelligence sources. I think they were filtering those out uh, just to keep from loading us up with information that uh, could get us killed if we got shot down. Conversely, they were kind of keeping that secret to protect their sources and methods. But at the same time, if they had let us know what was going on, we probably could have done a better job. Uh, like Lucky says, there were a lot of prepared sites. I would guess many hours before we took off, somebody probably had a semi clue where some of these sites were really active, but sources and methods would not allow them to go pass that down to our local intel shop is my guess. And you say, well, why would they do that? Well, they're still doing it today. Yeah. Let me tell you a quick just, anecdote. Just because uh, we can keep our secrets and even though the operator on, in the air, on the ground, whatever may be able to use that, we're going to protect our methods and sources and sometimes to the warfighters detriment. Still let, me, let me give you a quick anecdote, uh, not from the F-105, but from the F-4 with an F-105 driver in the cockpit, a guy named Bob Lodge was given complete access to all sources of intel uh, and uh, including Humint 
everything that was could be known about the North Vietnamese Air Force, he knew. And uh, I saw that on one mission that I flew with them uh, in the guerrillas head one night. Uh, but he had access to intel information that I could only dream of. Uh, but he said, uh, hey, I can't allow myself ever to be captured because I just know too much. And he was he was literally the man who knew too much. And on the first day of linebacker, when he got hit uh, uh, by cannon fire from a MiG-19, he rode his burning airplane into a smoking hole to avoid uh, the chance of being interrogated because he was a man who knew too much. And in the aftermath of that, uh, they brought Bill Kirk back over who had gotten two mid kills in the uh, in the eighth wing under Robin Olds, and uh, and they put that filter back in in an outfit called T ball. So our Air Force grew up a little bit in that respect, uh, mm -hmm. but you know nobody nobody expected Bob Lodge ever to get shot down, but he jumped right in the middle of them, uh, and uh, he was focusing on MiG twenty ones and MiG nineteens took off out of Yen Bay and snuck up on him and gunned him. It raises a, a, another question, and uh, you know, based on my observations, talking to um, you know, fighter aircraft and crewed aircraft, the, the guy in the front will often say, I don't really know much about what the guy in the back's doing. Um, was, was there a price on your head um, in terms of a particular price on your head because the North Vietnamese wanted to get access to or, or to interrogate a, a wild weasel pilot or bear? And, and E.T., I guess this is a question for you, really. Um, I suppose you, you wouldn't have the option of saying, well, I, I don't know what the guy in the back is doing because you, you are the guy in the back. Did, did you have a, a game plan for, for what you would do if you were, if you were captured? Well, I wasn't going to get shot down. Mike, Mike and I were never going to get shot down. We didn't have a game plan for that other than we weren't. I wasn't, he was. And I probably think he probably fell into the kind of the intel scenario that you're talking about, Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, for example, had been trained as a nuclear engineer at the Savannah uh, River uh, nuclear plant, and he was a nuclear engineer. And so besides being a, a wild weasel bear, he uh, he knew a, a whole bunch of things about our nuclear program. And so there was a strong suspicion among his family that he had been basically uh, taken to Russia for uh, exploitation all that he knew. Do you believe that? Yes. When you read the reports of the medical examiner's examination of his remains when they were returned, there's quite a bit of evidence there. Conspiracy theory, I don't know. I, I seriously think he was taken somewhere. Well, they, the North Vietnamese or whoever got his uh, uh, body performed a autopsy on him using East German techniques, whatever that means. Right. And by the way, the same thing, had and there was that suspicion, latent suspicion because of what had happened during the Korean War, that certain people who we knew got shot down and got uh, uh, picked up by the, by the North Koreans uh, just suddenly disappeared. Uh, and these were people with specific technical knowledge that we think probably went to China or Russia for technical exploitation. Can we talk about flying at night? It's, uh, been, it's been referenced a few times just to lighten, lighten the uh, the mood a little, but, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, I would have thought that the prospect of navigating at sort of 700 knots um, by daytime could be tr quite tricky, especially if you're doing things like listening to, um, you know, sort of your your raw gear or or, or trying to sort of assimilate uh, uh, some situational awareness around you know, what what a particular system or bunch of systems are doing relative to you. Um, how, how does that then translate into doing the same at night? And and um, I mean, you know, for example, if you if you if you're going to do a defense against a missile, how, how do you know you're not going to fly into the ground? I had one experience. I was supporting a B-52 strike up by Than Hua over a 19,000 foot undercast. Uh, and all of a sudden we get uh, lit up and we are the target. Uh, and uh, uh, now the, the pilots know that if you're above an overcast at 19,000 feet, 
and getting shot at by a SAM, the only way you can go is down. And so I lit the burner, dove into the undercast and was in the, in the undercast for probably a lifetime or two, or maybe only two or three minutes. But that undercast was completely lit up with SAMs that kept roaring by us. And I had to do my no, no uh, visual SAM break uh, continuously until the clouds, uh, light, uh, light effects turned off. Uh, and, and that was, uh, that was pretty terrifying because, you know, I knew where the ground was. We were right over Quan Lang. Uh, and so I knew where the, uh, I knew where the, uh, uh, ground was. I wasn't worried about hitting the ground, but I was really worried about missiles coming rolling up on me that I could not see. Uh, it's, it's a big advantage to be able to see during the daytime. As you may recall, it's been called a war, uh, hell in a very small place. So in the daytime, you got to know uh, all the aspects of that very small place, and it was easy to keep yourself oriented. So this may be, I don't know, true confessions. Some of these stories I only tell at the bar, but they're true. <laughs> uh, it, it was like one of my very first night missions back in the day when, as was alluded to earlier, there were a lot of SAMs in the lower root backs around the DMZ, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, my very first combat mission after my, my uh, you know, get acquainted ride was to the DMZ area and they shot two SAMs. Uh, like was also mentioned earlier, they were kind of unguided, but I knew they were in the air and yeah, I learned, I used a lot of afterburner to, uh, you know, make sure that I could break if I had to. I got dinged because I got to the pan tanker below bingo. But anyway, that's another story. My first or second night mission in the same area, I'm flying with an experienced bear in my back seat. His name won't be mentioned. And supporting B-52s. And as we are approaching the target area with the B-52s up above us and us between suspected SAM sites, I, I look to my left and I see this bright light at my left four o'clock. I mean, a blazing white light. And I went, holy shit. I said, is that a SAM? And my backseater said, Yep, that's a Sam. And so I turned into that blazing white light, lowered the nose, I jettisoned a standard arm and a centerline tank and a 450. And I got going to speed of heat. And I remember telling him, I've never done this at night. Actually, I've never done it before. He says, tell me when to pull. And he says, pull, pull. And as I pull into this blazing white light, which by the way, looked very realistic, like a Sam coming at me. I mean, as I'm going down, it looked like it was tracking me. I turn into it and it starts to fizzle out, right? Turns out it was uh, like an artillery flare and the army would shoot these things high into the air and they would be dazzlingly bright. Well, I mean, the worst part about it was I checked on the map later on where I was because it was a dark, pitch-ass black night. I pulled out like at 7,000 feet and the terrain in the area was up to eight or 9,000 feet. So this goes to the story, did I ever at night not be totally aware of where I was and maybe could I have hit the mountains or the, or the ground while I was doing something? The answer is yes, because I could have done that. By the way, in the debriefing, my bear swore it was a Sam. <laughs> He's going to stick by that story. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the uh, uh, easier aspects about flying at night is uh, clouds notwithstanding. That would be terrifying. But uh, in, in, the, in the clear, you can, you can see much better. So I always liked it that you could see the threats easier. Uh, and often we were up at uh, medium altitude. So there was, there was plenty of altitude to, you know, to maneuver if, if you needed to. So that's another perspective on it. 
Well, I think we got used to flying at night, didn't we? Because we flew a lot at night. And I got to tell you, I, I learned that night was good because you could see the AAA, you could see the SAMs come off the ground. Uh, yeah, right. Except for the first time I went to Hanoi at night, and that, that bugged me. <laughs> One. I think it would have been a lot different for, for the, uh, the F-111s and the A-6s that were, that were doing very low-level ingresses, you know, in the clouds with, with their automatic terrain following. Um, that would have been a different story. I, I know I had a, um, a Marine friend who flew A-6s. He, he talking about, the, you know, the AAA coming in. He's down between a couple of mountains and, and seeing AAA come in while, while he's drop, dropping on a run. So that's a different world. I don't, I don't know if, if lucky you, you had that kind of experience, but I, I certainly never did. No. But what's the balance then? I mean, this, this might just be a stupid question, but, but what is the balance between using your afterburner at night and um, not? Uh, because, you know, so you've just said, well, you can see the defense is coming up, but, but if you use your afterburner, they can see you. Um, so, so how do you... How do you judge when is a good time to use it and when's not? Speed is life. Yeah. I never had any qualms about using my afterburner at night. No. I got a good Doppler check one night over Than Hua. Tom put the <laughs> afterburner on, crown lit up, and I says, I know exactly where I am and updated my <laughs> Doppler. <laughs> <laughs> not recommended, but it worked. Yeah. The theory is, tell- you got your afterburner going, you're probably going too fast for the gomers on the ground to uh, <laughs> to line you up and shoot at you. So, I was flying down the DMZ one time, uh, and I saw Sam lift off above Dong Hoi, and uh, and he lifted up, lifted off, and uh, Mike said, "Hey, we got to Sam TTR, uh, and we're in the sector." And I said, I want, like a dumb shit pilot, I said, uh, I wonder who they're shooting at. So I'm watching this thing, and I thought, and I said, well, I guess I better get some speed up. So I lit the afterburner, and I'm going downhill really, really fast. And this thing is, is closing on us. Uh, and I'm just about supersonic. And the missile goes by our tail. And so I'm at 0.95 Mach or above, and I hear the missile explode which meant he was too damn close. Yeah. yeah, you've mentioned, Lucky, the azimuth sector light, which really was the most telltale light in the front cockpit as far as I was concerned. Because the APR 35, 36, whatever it was, you know, in, when I was flying up there, I had signals all over the place and it was hard to interpret it most of the time. But if that asthma sector light came on, you knew that you had better be doing something, right? It was telling you, right, you were right in the center of the target tracking radars, track while scan radar, right? And, uh, and that's, the whole, that's the thing I was looking at the whole time uh, you were leading me around Hanoi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> GT can probably address this, but as I recall, that uh, as sector off shit light was not only azimuth and elevation scan, but pulse to pulse coincidence with the tra- the beacon to the missile. So oh, yeah. you had all three of those together. Right. Yeah. The tar- this target du jour. Uh, hence, it was off shit. That, yeah. means, that, that means they're looking at you. <laughs> and, you're, and you're not supposed to do a self test on takeoff either. <laughs> wasn't me but there was a bear out there that attempted that once never again <laughs> T- tell the story yeah. what, what happened dt oh i wasn't in the airplane but somebody had done that it was you don't need that kind of light stuff going noises and flashing and all that in the middle of takeoff <laughs> yeah takeoff was scary enough yeah <laughs> Well, what, what what is this sort of um, the, the profile then in terms of speed for for the defensive maneuver? Because 
my you know my understanding of it is that you you will have let's say a corner velocity um, where you're going to get your best turn sustained turn rate from from the aeroplane. Um, but you, you're talking about going really really fast, which presumably means you'll be able to pull lots of G's, but not necessarily get the same turn rate or or a smaller turn radius. So why were you going really fast rather than necessarily hitting a, a, a corner velocity? Well, one particular <laughs> issue that has not been brought up is the wing loading of an F-105. And it is, it is horrendous. It's over 100, 100 pounds per square foot. And yes, you can pull Gs, but whenever you pull Gs of the high wing load airplane, you lose speed. And the Thud was a classic example of that. So I always wanted to get as fast as I could because I knew I had one pull in me and maybe I'd have enough for a second pull if I needed it. So have, being at the maximum or optimum turn radius rate of 350 or 380 knots, whatever it was, was not an issue. Fast as you can, keep as much energy on the airplane as you can so you have some maneuver potential. Yeah. Well, and you got to remember the, uh, the SAM, uh, the SA-2 was coming at you at uh, Mach 2 and a half to 3 and he was more heavily wing loaded than you were. So the critical thing was to use your superior maneuvering at that speed to not only uh, pull up and get out of the way of his flight path, but also roll over the top of him, kind of an orthogonal roll right over the top of him so as to close the distance on him uh, faster than he can see it going in his vacuum tube technology down below and make the missile go off below and behind you. Did they ever launch uh, one one tactic I've heard of is with proportional navigation um, systems is is to point at the ground um, so that the missile is obviously trying to generate a, a lead pursuit curve the missile flies into the ground and then you you can pull up was that something you had the option of doing were the ranges sufficient to allow that to work did you try it Generally, we were at a higher altitude we didn't get down there in the ground fire because we knew that it was lethal perhaps more lethal than the SAMs. So our operating altitudes in the uh, area over Hanoi were between 18 and about 15,000 feet. And that gave us enough altitude to trade off in our SAM brake maneuvers, but it didn't force us down into the AAA and the, uh, and the automatic weapons fire that could be even more lethal. What about visually sighting the missile? And so it, at nighttime, obviously, you've, you've talked about it, you know, illuminating the ground uh, over the un, under the undercast. Um, uh, and obviously, you can see it while it's uh, there's still a flame coming out of it, I suppose. But, but um, did it glow when you know, the, it dropped the booster? Or you know, could you, was there a point at which it would stop emitting light and then it was very difficult for you to see? Uh, uh, engine. Uh, go ahead, Paul. I uh, just to say it had a sustainer engine. So when the booster dropped off, then the sustainer engine was, would glow. And I don't know uh, where it burned out, but I the, the one that the first one I saw, like fish, it was glowing all the way uh, until it went off. Yep. yep. What, what I, I kind of remember, um, you, you'd see this big, uh, this is this is a night under an undercast. There's a uh, there's a, a big billow of, of white light as the booster sh shoots off, and then it kind of collapses for maybe a second or two, and and then you know when the when the rocket fires off, you, the light the, the the bright light under the clouds comes back, and then that that white light just kind of compresses down as as the missile comes, and then a, a little needle of light pops out of the top of the clouds, and and then it you know comes on up. So it's pretty interesting to watch it. <laughs> it's, it's more interesting in hindsight. You're easily entertained, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> you got to admit, it was a pretty, uh, pretty spectacular air show, you know? Yeah, it was. Can we talk about then the, the development of, of your tactics then? So we talked a little bit about what the SAM operators were doing. Uh, how, how did you develop, well, how did your tactics develop over, over, let's say, the year or so we're talking about that sort of 72, 71, 72, 73 period, which is three years, but over that period? 
Well, the big the big change was the addition of the hunter killer teams paired up with the F4s uh, 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 carrying hard ordnance CBU 20 uh, 52-58 to get a hard kill on a SAM site, anyone that was stupid enough to shoot at us, as well as having our own air-to-air -air capability and the, and the 4 by 4 missiles on the F-4. So that was the, the big change in tactics. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we tried various things, uh, uh, two weasels together and uh, two F-4s together, one weasel and three F-4s. We tried all different kinds of things. Uh, but I think in, in the end result, uh, two weasels and two F4s for element integrity worked out best. Yeah. That's what we did mostly during my daylight missions towards the end of uh, linebacker one. Right. Two F4s, two 105Gs in the lead. It's interesting that the uh, F4s, a uh, lot of power, three bags, you know, CBUs, bombs. I mean, I don't know how much they weighed, but they were a big draggy machine. Uh, we had like maybe two thirds or maybe half the fuel load that they had. And we would bingo them out if we were pushing in and doing our speeds like 500 plus all the time because they were having to use afterburner to stay with us. But it was nice to have them with us because not only did they carry the weapons uh, if we did sniff out a SAM site, uh, but they had some sparrows on board and maybe some AIM-9s as well. So they were kind of like uh, our own uh, air defense version of fighters with us. But they talked a lot. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> that's because there was, yeah, that's because they did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a thud flight to get up there and you'd hear hardly anything over the radio. The F4s take off and it's fuel checks every 10 seconds. And it's just amazing the the, the talk. And it's them. it's also dodging the tanks that they jettison because they're going in at 20 plus thousand and we're going in at 15,000. And as they get into the target area, your tanks start flying, man. You had to keep your eyes out for these tanks floating down. Lucky, you, you you mentioned right at the beginning of the conversation about second time around, you were sometimes asked to be a non-jamming target. You also mentioned that you put the jamming pods on the on the little side cheeks on that F-105G. Can can we talk um, a little bit about that jamming aspect then? So they, they did develop the ability to home on jam. Um, they did, you know, burn through of a, a jamming source is, I guess, a function of range and power. Um, you know, what, what were the considerations around the use of jamming? You know, could you, um, you know, sort of lure them into uh, transmitting against the jamming target while another non-jamming target was sneaking out behind them or, you know, from the, from the other direction? What, what could you do? Uh, we always flew, and Ed, you can correct me on this, but we always flew with the pods off. And then once we knew we were defensive with a missile coming at us, it was pods on, pods on, pods on. Uh, and uh, the exact capabilities of the LQ-105 pod, whether it was a range gate uh, pull off or whether it was strictly noise jamming, I'll leave that to Ed to describe. It was probably ma mainly no noise jamming. And, and that's exactly, it was a defensive thing only. We didn't try any kind of, well, let's put this little jamming formation up here and let somebody shoot at them and put a missile through the middle and then we'll attack the site. We didn't play that kind of game at all. That wasn't to... Uh, we had B-52s to do that. <laughs> so we never did and, that intentionally. It was defensive only. And parenthetically, if the buffs were up and if the uh, uh, E-6s were up, the electric E-6s were up, the jamming output from those was such that it made it very difficult for the bears to sort out where the uh, threat signals were. We had one other jammer on there too, uh, called the LT-34. It was kind of a low band jammer they would go after some of their um, acquisition radars down in, down in the lower bands, VHF band. Uh, surprisingly, I had done some, when I was a, an engineer at Hill, that was one of my projects that I had was testing out, testing that system out on an F4 down at Eglin. And I went down through their TDY, taking these copper strips and taping them on the inside with masking tape on the inside of the F4 antenna and going up and uh, having the 
have in the F4 do some jamming uh, jamming runs against, uh, I guess it was a spoon rest at the time, at one of the rages down at Eglin. And it never got it never got bought for the F4. Then I get into the F105 three years later, and poof, what's on the airplane is the LT, ALT34. Uh, but we did use that occasionally, at least I did. It wasn't one of those standard tactics that we briefed during every mission to go out and say, hey, when you're supporting the buff, go and use this at a certain time. I just kind of messed around with it to see if I can see if I can mess around with the heads on the ground and their system to see if it confused things, slowed things down. I never saw any pros or cons, but it obviously messed up our radio system a little bit here and there. And we had some calm issues here and there, but so it jammed us as well sometimes. But uh, they were there, but it wasn't funny. It wasn't a big deal in, uh, in training at Nellis about, hey, here's, here's the tactics to go about using it. It was kind of there and you were taught that it was there and that was about it. From, from an emotional point of view then, did you feel that there was parity with the the SAM operators? Did you feel that you actually had a, a technological or a tactical advantage over them? Um, how, how did you feel about your, your opponents? Hmm. I thought we... I thought we had a good capability. I didn't, uh, you know, the kinds of things we wanted and we visualized having came true in the F4G and then the F16 later on in the HTS system. Uh, you know, having strobes and saying, hey, it's out in that general direction, or here's a power level difference on a, on a, on a scope. And if you go turn the airplane, all of a sudden they level out and now you know that's where you're in that general direction. That's all fine and good, uh, but you, you, we didn't know how far away they were from us. However, they knew how far away we were from them. So they had the advantage there. Uh, but I think we're, I think we did well. I think we were comparable. We made up for our deficiencies and they did their best to make up for some of theirs. Well, and anytime you uh, go into North Vietnam, it was an adrenaline shot. Uh, you know, no matter how you were feeling, as you were coming off the tank line going up there, once you got in and got engaged, you were just really busy doing your job and didn't have time to be concerned about your hide or how it was gonna survive. I used to characterize it as kissing your ass goodbye and doing your job and seeing what came out the other side. Did you feel like yeah. that there was, you know, that they, they had the same amount of sort of at risk as you did um, because if you fire one of those missiles at a, a radar van it, it shreds it doesn't it did they have the same sort of risk sort of um, profile as you did well, yeah, I think uh, let me just say from my perspective I, I wouldn't say they had the advantage but I don't certainly don't think we did. I mean, ET said it. We we don't know where they are in terms of range. They know where we are. The best we can do is we can pick up their signals and maybe point at them. And hence, uh, our mission became primarily one of suppression. I think they were definitely concerned about a strike reaching the basket while they were still emitting. And so they would shut down and that in turn would make the strike force a little bit safer. Uh, very frustrating, not knowing what kind of battle damage you may have attained and never will. I mean, we used to say, shoot a strike into the air where it lands, I know not where, but it, it did keep them on their toes. And I think it was effective from a term, from a, from a perspective of suppression. Uh, but you know, like in the old days, being able to say we found and we destroyed a SAM site never happened while I was there. And I wish it had, but um, felt like that we were, we were doing our job. And, uh, and so how that equates to, do I think they had the advantage or not? I, I don't know. Can we talk about numbers then? So, lucky you said there were 31 or so um, active uh, sites, you know, 200 people per sites, but 331 uh, systems. Um, I, I don't know the numbers, but an SA2 uh, 
um, site has what is it six or eight missiles on on launchers? Um, you guys are a flight of four, but only two of you are missile shooters. So, um, and you're carrying two missiles. So, uh, are they in a position where actually they can get you to shoot off all of your missiles, and then they're still in a position to go out and then and attack the strike force? Yeah, I think we saw some of that later on, where they would come up and tickle, trying to get us shoot our, to shoot our missiles prematurely, and then get really serious about shooting down members of the strike force. I, I think they uh, started using that as well as the emission control, where they pop up and pop down and pop up and pop down from different sites scattered around the Red River Valley uh, to try to get us to, uh, you know, kind of like whack-a-mole, trying to get us to uh, uh, shoot at the first thing that came up. And so you had to withhold your fire a little bit and see who was really serious about doing the job that day. So I think everybody has has, has you know, sort of referenced some of the missions that, that you flew, but are there um, particular missions that, you know, you still dream about or you, you still recall or you, maybe you wish you'd done something different on that mission, you know, where you, you maybe you lost flight members or, or actually went, things went well and, and, and it never repeated. Um, what, what missions did you fly that, that stick in your minds? Uh, well, Steve, I think you must have been talking directly to me because there is still one mission that I have dreams about. Uh, it was Tom Zorn and Mike Two Roses shoot down over Little Thud Ridge. Uh, we were on a hunter killer mission. We had two F4 wingmen. Tom was leading my element, I was his wingman. Uh, we had covered the strike package and we were actually egressing towards the Gulf of Tonkin and the F-4s had uh, split from the flight to do some road recce looking for an alternate target for their you know, big load of weapons that they hadn't expended on that mission. But like usual, there was a lot of, uh, you know, SAM activity, not the classic stuff, but we would have launch lights all the time uh, not all the time, but launch lights that were, were, we weren't certain they were really launch lights or anything. We got, by the way, the weather was sort of good, but there was cumulus buildups, you know, this tall fair weather queue kind of stuff. And uh, as we're egressing, um, the F4s said that they had indications of a SAM launch. So Tom and I were looking and, and out of the, I just, I turned right and there was an SA-2 in level flight, you know, barreling right toward us, right out of a cloud. Uh, I immediately broke right. I noted that Tom started a break right as well. And the SAM guided and blew up right between us. And I, I would guess we were a couple of thousand feet apart. But right on its tail was another SAM uh, and it guided and blew up behind Tom. Uh, Tom immediately said he'd been hit, he rolled out. I rolled out and we kept heading towards the Gulf. And we got all the way feet wet. Um, uh, we were at medium altitude, 10, 12, 15,000 feet. And I pulled up. Now that we're feet wet, I pulled up on Tom's wing and uh, and we talked a bit. You know, he, he says, am I on fire? And I says, there's no flames. I see smoke or fuel streaming from the aft end of the airplane. And and then shortly after that, his last words were, I've got to get out. As the airplane was slightly starting to roll to the left. And I'm, I'm right there on his wing and I watched two ejections, two good shoots, and they start floating down. You know, I'm circling around, you know, calling Red Crown, trying to get a rest cap started. Before I leave, the F-4s that had detached were now back in and they see the parachutes 
they have more fuel, they take over the rest cap. I'm bingo, I'm bingo minus. And, uh, and Big Mother, the helicopter from the Navy is inbound and says, I've got the chutes in sight. And I said, okay, F4s, you got it, I leave. And I call Red Crown. I, I asked for vectors to the tank or over the Gulf. They say, they can't help me. They're busy with the rest cap or a SAR cap. I'm going, no shit. So they say, go to tanker primary. I go to tanker primary. I call the tankers, nobody answers. I go to secondary, nobody answers. And now I'm really skosh on fuel. I'm going out towards the Gulf. I, we have a beacon, the tankers have a beacon and our, our radar, which is not an air to air radar, but it will pick up a tanker beacon. And I get the no kidding double slash on my radar at about 15 or 20 miles. And I do my own intercept and I, I see a cell of three tankers and pull up on the last tanker. Still not talking to them, can't get them. I've called them on guard, everything. I pull up on the right wing and right next to the co-pilot and I'm given this emergency. I need fuel right away. Boom comes down, I slide back and I get hooked up. When I got hooked up and I think Paul and, uh, and Fred and, uh, and Lucky will vouch for me. When the gauge says it's below 500 pounds, you don't know how much gas you have. And even if you really had that much gas, you've only got about five minutes if it's 500 pounds. And I hooked up on that tanker clean as a whistle and took a full load of gas and went home thinking, well, shit hot. I'll be able to see Tom and Mike when I get back because Big Mother was right there. Well, they didn't get Tom and Mike. Uh, they were taking shells from the shore. Uh, they almost lost a PJ in the recovery. Uh, and the PJ guys said, I, I heard afterwards that neither one of them had released themselves from the chute. And, and the one guy that they went into the water to recover was actually under the water and neither body was recovered. And, and the reason I have nightmares is because I keep wondering if I should have said, you know, condor break right when I first saw that Sam. Um, I, I, my mind tells me that Tom broke right same time I did, but yeah. So I, I, I dream about this one all the time. And by the way, I had, I had two best friends while I was there, Al Matija, who I lost the first day I got there and Tom Zorn, and I lost him in September of 1972. So that's my story. It's, it's obviously been a long time. So it's, you know, there, there has been no, um, let's say, release for you in, in that respect. Uh, so time hasn't really made any difference to you. Um, and this is for, for everybody, really. But you know, I think uh, the idea of um, post-traumatic stress disorder is something that's well known now, well recognized, and um, is, um, you know, there there are now, I think, in the military facility set up to help people deal with those things. Um, but do you think that that you have experienced PTSD? I mean, is is that for you that recurring dream or, or nightmare or the questioning without being able to answer it? Is that something that... Um, you know, you, you would you would sort of recognize as a PTSD type thing. Have you ever, you know, as, as a group, have you, have, do you, you know, just talking about these things help? Um, you know, how, how do you reflect on the trauma of the experiences that you had? I mean, and, and I don't mean to suggest that, you know, because I know you'll be thinking, well, it wasn't as traumatic as the people, you know, for the people who died or the people who ended up in the Hanoi Hilton, you know, you know, you, you got a flight in that respect, but 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 what's the you know what's the the mental approach to you know how you have dealt with the trauma in, in the years that have, have passed since? Well, Steve, I think that's a fair question, and I really don't know how to answer it. I, I mean, I mean, I, I just 
you know, I just always wondered um, if, if I could have made a difference. And, you know, I, I mean, I went on and flew another, you know, 30 or 40 missions over north and, and you know, we lost people. Um, when it happens to be a close friend, it's a little bit tougher. I, I don't think that I uh, felt any debilitating effects and no, I never sought any counsel or anything like that, but I don't know. Um, you know, this kind of interview just uh, brings out those things that uh, you've thought about for a bunch of years and, and it, it feels good to tell somebody about it, I guess. I, I think we, uh, we saw a lot of the PTSD kind of behaviors, uh, drinking too much, driving too fast, uh, fractured marriages uh, in, the, in the strike pilots in those days, uh, less so perhaps in our weasels, because remember we had, we had command of the arena. We were, we were King Kong in that arena and we went in there to, to, with a mission to kill and nobody to tell us how to do it. And so that was a good thing. Uh, a lot of the strike pilots had to go day after day against the same targets, uh, whether they thought it was a smart thing to do or not. So we saw, we saw alcoholic behavior, uh, notably the first F-105 pilot ever to make 200 missions was stationed back at, uh, uh, this was Larry Waller, he was stationed back at TAC headquarters. Uh, and one night after dinner, he went up upstairs and blew his brains out. Now, you know, now we know that that was probably PTSD and not unable to cope with all that he had seen and done. Uh, but of course, PTSD was not uh, a recognized diagnosis in our day, and it came on much later. Uh, but I, I'm convinced that it was there and in our ranks. Uh, and... Uh, so we, you know, we didn't know how to deal with it and the, the command structure didn't know how to deal with it. And so we just uh, classified it as aberrant behavior and uh, tended to uh, criticize the individuals, but uh, it was clearly there. Uh, and I think we saw some of it in the weasel squadrons uh, in the, things were pretty intense there in 1972. You know, when you lose 10 weasels in about a year's period, uh, that's uh, that's not a picnic. So, so where do you go as as a as a professional aviator then, um, having been in this um, combat environment, massively risky, um, very dynamic, um, highly charged? How do you then settle back into? Um, a rhythm of flying airplanes in peacetime. Yeah, that's difficult to do, and it's difficult to behave yourself. I'll tell a I'll tell a story of my good friend Leo Thorsness. He, uh, of course, got the Medal of Honor, and then and then later was shot down and went to the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, but he uh, lost his pilot qualifications because he was out chasing trains in a light airplane uh, when he got back home. Uh, just because he needed to do something to get his adrenaline level up. And the FAA took a very dim view of that. And so they pulled his uh, ticket. So you see, you see all kinds of heightened risk-taking behavior, which is characteristic of PTSD among people. Uh, and you saw the fractured marriages among many of the POWs uh, who had uh, internalized everything and therefore it pretty well shut down in terms of communication. So uh, that war took a toll uh, and it took a PTSD toll, especially on those who were POWs, but also on a lot of the same people who, uh, who got through their 100 missions and went home, but they were kind of ticking time bombs uh, for at least a couple of years until they managed to put all that behind them. Or you do like Paul Metz and I did and go to test pilot school. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And, and then you had a high adrenaline level there at test pilot school. There you go. That was well, very safe. Flew, and you flew with the Navy too. And so that, uh, that, that must have raised the level. 
Yeah, yeah. I got 10 traps and cats on the USS Ranger and the F4. <laughs> so, Steve, uh, I'll, I'll comment a little bit. Uh, you know, I, when I look back, uh, particularly at the linebacker, too, you know, you, you wonder. Uh, we lost 15 B 52s uh, over those 11 days. You know, if, if you had taken a shot here or not taken a shot there and save your standard arm for a different one, might you have saved the B 52? You, you, there's a lot of it you never know. Um, and um, one thing I, I think I'd say to Wayne is, you know, that it's, a, it's an extremely fast and, and dynamic and chaotic situation. And, and everybody up there is doing their best all the time and when you're in an environment where the, the tiniest little uh, difference can can make such huge consequences you know it, to life and death um, tr I, I think it's helpful in hindsight not to try to uh, second death second guess yourself and remember you know that that you were we were all doing our best all the time that we could at the time none of us were perfect we all made mistakes you know okay Thanks, Fred. And and I didn't mean, and Wayne, I was not implying you made a mistake. I, I, not at all. Gotcha. So, just a closing question from me then: What were the the big lessons learned that came out of the wild weasel experience then, or the development of the wild weasel? concept um through the end of the vietnam war um you know et you, you've already said that you you went on to the f4g and then you were around a bit for the f16cj and, and i think you know, since then you've worked in in that space in a, as a civilian but what in, in the immediate aftermath of the the end of that sort of vietnam experience what did you guys go back to the air force with as messages to say this is what we should be doing and this is how we should be or how we could have done better. I think from an <clears throat> from an airplane standpoint, I think all the all the weasels that came out of that and got into positions of being able to find money and, and advanced technology, <clears throat> excuse me, I think resulted in the F4G. All the deficiencies that we had in, in the 105 days, all the things we said, wouldn't it be neat if we knew this or could do that? I think that all came to fruition in the G model. Uh, I mean, it had location capabilities. It came out with the harm. Uh, we could do things in a, in a four ship of F4Gs that we just dream about in the 105. Yeah, the 105 was fast. Uh, it wasn't great at low level. But hey, us F4s, man, we could go to war at low level any day until we found out, well, maybe you can't really do that in Europe anyhow, so let's go high. <laughs> like we did in, in uh, Desert Storm. Because uh, down low is not a great place to fly, even though you got the capability of doing it. But the, the technology we got in the, in, the, in the force that we got between ACC, TAC at the time, uh, Avotech, and Systems Command to put all their minds together and their money together and uh, lots of weasels, ex weasels together T Bear, myself, Denny Haney, you know, a, a host of names of the whole 105 world. Uh, well, Mike, Michael Bryan, uh, and just a whole bunch that that went on to get the new technology in the F4G, and then lo and behold, drug the F16 along and, and converted them with a with a with the system of the HTS. That it is just amazing to see what you can do with a with a a, a pod. Probably the I'm trying to think how long it is. It's maybe from my wall to me, this long kind of routine and the technology put into that that actually took my space and took my, my, my job essentially and allows the pilot to do so many, many more things now. Well, and it, a lot of things haven't changed. Uh, when we were doing the Kosovo war, I ended up having to go over to Europe and field a new version of software in a harm missile system at both Spang Dahlem and over at uh, Aviano. And to go in and listen to a mission briefing and a mission debrief Close my eyes, you know, all the way from the start of the briefing, from the weather guy to the to the end of the briefing, it could have been the, it could have been a 105 briefing. Same kind of thought processes. The technology was there in a much smaller box, only one guy to handle it. But the way this avionics has been put together, the software and the displays and all that, it's it's truly a, a single a single pilot mission now. 
and they can do so much more. And it's just uh, to watch the technology advance. And all the weasels that came through the 105 world kind of kept into the into that world in the systems command and ACC and, and Apotech and have just continually kept that going. Same with the F4Gs, all those guys, a lot of them stayed in the world, whether they've been as a DOD contractor, DOD, DOD support contractor, and kept taking that weasel mission saying, we're out there to go and, and allow those attack guys to do their things, to allow the bombers to do those things, to keep those other guys alive and basically play bait. And that whole philosophy, both in equipment design, mentality, it's, it's all still there. Well, I, ET, I, I stopped work five years ago, and, but it was there right to that day. And I knew guys that were in the F-16s that went transitions at 35s. And that mentality is still moving forward. Yeah, ET, I, um, from, from my perspective, uh, you said right in your very first few sentences what I think we needed most uh, coming out of Vietnam. And that was a system that gave us range to the threat and a better weapon, uh, which turned out to be the harm. And I think those two things were like the bread and butter of the F4G, albeit they have better technology and, and better uh, capability to receive signals and stuff. But those two things would have made a world of difference to me, I can tell you. Yep, guaranteed. It was fun to fly. Didn't do it in combat. I missed combat in the F4G though. I retired before that, but I was able to support it from a desk standpoint uh, at Eglin while all that was going on. Yeah, I had the uh, first uh, operational F4G squadron there at George and was also training half the air crews. And it was just a wonder to see the additional capabilities of that airplane. We didn't have harms to train with yet. We were still flying AGM 78s, but what a wonderful machine that was. Uh, and uh, it, it had maneuvering capability, uh, agility that would enable it to uh, beat some of the more maneuverable later SANS. And so I really, uh, I really love flying the F4G. Yeah, I was going to ask, and it might be a, a question for Paul, but uh, well, for everybody, but but particularly Paul, given you know his wife twenty three and F twenty two experience. But I, I wonder at, a, at an unclassified level whether the uh, advancing capability of modern double digit SAMs has been matched by the advancing capability of, um, let's say, four point five gen airframes uh, like the F-16CJ or F-15E or um, F-18. Uh, 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 is there a, a degree of, of being outpaced in the, the development war when it comes to what modern SAM systems can do? It, it feels like a, as a civilian, SA-2 versus F-105, you know, there's almost parity there. You could, you know, you, there, you, you've got an even, even opportunity. Um, but, you know, let's say an, an SA, SA-11 or SA-20 or whatever versus F-15, F-16, it, it feels like that's not a fair fight. Well, the, the systems we've been talking about, certainly from the F-105, but all the way up to current day, are really what I call sight systems. In other words, you've got to see something. The enemy's got to be able to see you on a radar scope. You've got to be able to see the enemy on our RWR equipment or see them visually. If we have a SAM shot at us, we've got to see the SAM and maneuver visually against the SAM. So there's this element of seeing. And you can postulate or hypothesize what would the combat environment be like if one of those elements was invisible? First of all, it would probably change our tactics immeasurably. And it would certainly change the dynamics of the fight if somebody was invisible and they could see you, but you couldn't see them. Uh, so the technologies are, are of that nature. That's the kind of things that stealth brings to the world of aviation. And in the weasel role, it, it could have profound effects. Is, is there a sense then that, I mean, so, so I get what you're saying, so does that indicate then that because something like, 
you know, 16 CJ, you can you can paint it with special paint to lower its RCS. You can put RAM coatings on it, whatever. But fundamentally, it's it's a big fat RCS target, right? Is that sort of a, a, an emission that maybe you know F35, F22 might have a capability against those sort of SAMs? But but actually, the F15 or F16 or F18 type platform is at a disadvantage. Well, I obviously can't get into the details, but stealthy airplanes are stealthy airplanes. Yeah, I think they're a game changer, and I don't know much about them. Uh, you know, I lived at uh, Tyndall Air Force Base and had the had the F-22s going over all the time. But uh, stealth is a game changer, and though some uh, acquisition radars may in fact be able to break the code on stealth coatings and stealth airplanes, it's always at the last minute and uh, probably too late for a tracking radar to make take advantage of it. And so uh, John Jumper, when he was uh, chief of staff of the Air Force said, our stealth, our concentration on stealth is the kick down the door force. Uh, and that's why you can see us uh, keeping the F-16 around for a long time, keeping uh, bringing back more F-15 EXs because we realize that uh, uh, we need missile trucks we need second wave airplanes after the first wave airplanes, the stealth airplanes have gone in and basically kicked down the door of these lethal air defenses. Are you a fan of the F-15EX then, Lucky? Say again? Are, are you a fan of the F-15EX? I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, it does not detract that much from the F-35. And the F-15 fleet was just flat wearing out structurally to a point where it was no longer economical to keep in service. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, including conformal fuel tanks and, and other things, avionics in the F-15 EX that make it, I think, a, a good choice, a good interim choice worth 144 of them uh, because we're not bringing uh, the... Uh, the, the stealth airplanes on. I think we've gone from a, uh, an all stealth mentality, just as once upon a time we had an all jet mentality, to realize that complementary capabilities and vulnerabilities uh, uh, have a place properly used tactically. And uh, we've got smart fighter pilots who will figure out how to use them together. For example, uh, uh, a uh, F-22 or an F-35 is no longer stealthy when you hang bombs or stuff on the outside of it. But you can get an F-15EX that can haul 15 Mark 82s or a whole bunch of uh, long range air to air missiles now under development. And it can be the missile truck that through data link uh, syncs up with the F-22 and makes bad guys airplanes uh, blow up wholesale uh, uh, courtesy of the F-22 being out there on the point and passing information back to the missile truck. So I think there are ways that smart fighter pilots can make that work. And it's probably a good thing. Uh, anything that you can do that makes you less predictable and makes and, and varies the attack uh, complicates the problem for the bad guys. And I agree with everything that Lucky just said, by the way. After 15 years on the ACC requirement staff and part of the staff that brought the F-15 EX on, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and it frees up a back seat for some more rewills. There you go. <laughs> uh, we're not planning on using the back seat though, ET. Sorry. What's it going on the? What are you putting in the back seat? <laughs> Incentive rides. <laughs> <laughs> I could use Feel one tight. of those. <laughs> I could use an incentive ride right about now. <laughs> yeah, couldn't we all? <laughs> okay, we, we've been talking for for uh, two and a half hours almost. Um, I said final question, but this is my final question then. Is there anything that we should have talked about that we haven't there in regards to the, the story of the weasels or your experiences? Well, I would say that uh, you, asked the, you haven't asked the why question. You know, why did we do that? Why did we take our aviation skills and uh, lay them on the line again? In my case, I was fat cat in Geneva and I had friends that were in the Hanoi Hilton and more going in there every, every week or so. Uh, and I felt a, a duty 
to those friends to do everything I could to get them out. Admittedly, I went to the war when it was seemed to be a phony war, but it didn't stay that way uh, for more than a couple of days after I got to Karat, but it was worth it. And so the sacred mission was one, protecting the people who were doing the, the hard work of carrying the bombs. And if you've never seen a laser guided bomber, uh, particularly a paved way, uh, circling a target in Hanoi, like the canal, the Lapides Bridge or the Duma Bridge, uh, illuminating that bridge with a laser uh, at 370 knots in a SAM zone, while other guys are trying to find the basket and dump uh, two 2,000 pound laser guided bombs into it. Those guys need all the help they can get. Uh, and uh, so uh, we as weasels did that because you know, it was almost like a rescue mission. We did that so that the other guys could do, do their mission and survive it uh, and, uh, and get the job done with far fewer airplanes than had been necessary uh, three or four years previously. So it, was it worthwhile? You betcha. It was entirely worthwhile. Ultimately, it ended up we got our POWs out. Ultimately, we essentially won the war in the air. Uh, I think we could have done better if we'd have been allowed to clean house on the SAMs uh, a couple of months before and absolutely kill the valley. Uh, the buffs would have probably survived better. Uh, they would have survived better if they hadn't done that stupid off target 135 degree turn that pointed their, their jamming packages to China uh, and allowed the SAMs underneath them to come up on the air and, and, and acquire them at the last minute to guide to an intercept. So I think we could have cut those losses more than in half, maybe down to a third if we had done some more things start uh, smart. Uh, but that was part of the SAC uh, uh, ethos and uh, uh, mentality that they were gonna do it just the way they'd done it in World War II. Uh, and it took a while to shake them out of that. And once they got shaken out of that, the losses went down. And, and at the end of the day, in the 11 days of Christmas, uh, North Vietnam was a basket case, and that's why they were so eager to sign. Okay, Steve, you asked uh, you asked a question in the in the pre-interview about uh, did did we feel prepared going into our first missions, and I, I wanted to comment that um, I felt prepared. I was scared, but I felt prepared. Uh, because the, the Air Force uh, pilot training is, is so excellent. The RTU training, the, the training for the uh, weasels there at Nellis, and then getting on site, uh, the support and the leadership we had from our, our local commanders uh, and our mentors, uh, including Lucky, uh, really appreciated all of that. I know, Lucky, you gave us um, a checklist for, for going into um, – you know, into the combat areas, always uh, read that and appreciated things like that, you know, to help us. Uh, I wanted to compliment the maintenance crews uh, in, in particular as well. And um, just uh, re reflecting on it, having gone into a business career, I can tell you the Air Force uh, training is just miles ahead of, of, uh, of the business world. It's, it's uh, just the uh, orders of magnitude better than anything I ever saw outside the military. And I always appreciated that. Yeah. And, and where the training, I talked to some F-16 drivers who were just graduating from, from school. And I said, what your training gives you is not perfect preparation for the next war, but training building blocks that lets you adapt very quickly to the next war, whenever it comes in, in, in whatever form it may come. Did red flag, so red flag started in 75, I think. First red flag was in 75. Did that make a difference from a training point of view? You bet. Absolutely. When uh, when I got the first F4G Wild Weasel Squadron, uh, much to the disgust of my wing commander and the wing chief of maintenance, I kept uh, four F4Gs at red flag for every single red flag where I was commander of the squadron because the Air Force, the fighter force needed to see what this new weasel could do for them. Uh, and they were going up against very competent SAM operators or SAM simulator operators. Uh, 
Uh, and but red flag, red flag was that margin of survival that carried over then into Allied force in Bos Bosnia and carried over into Desert Storm. So we were a very different Air Force when we went to Desert Storm than we were when we came out of Vietnam. And we had learned and we had put the lessons to good use.